classes in polymer dynamics based on George Philly's book, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics, Cambridge University Press, 2011. And today, this lecture is Lecture 1, Course Introduction. Uh, welcome to Physics 597D. I am Professor Phillies. You can reach me, my WPI email address is that. You will, however, do better emailing me at home much of the time if you have questions. There. Uh, I have a handout. It's downstairs. We will end class slightly early and go down to my office, and I will give you the handout with the class schedule. Uh, the handout also discusses presentation of research papers in terms of footnoting, uh, citing references properly, and that sort of thing, which since you're graduate students, you should more or less know, and it's mostly a friendly reminder. As I say, this is an advanced graduate class. The objective of the class is to discuss how polymer movement solution, um, you take away from a course like this as much as you put into it, and as long as you do a respectable job, you get the appropriate grade. Um, having said that, we are primarily based on reading my textbook, Phenomenology of Polymer Solution Dynamics. There's also a supplemental volume, which is the complete numerical tables, um, which probably do not need to buy for this course, but if you were doing research, you'd find it quite useful. Okay, so what are we going to do? The course is 28 lectures. Uh, as I said, there will be reading assignments. I don't plan on having a midterm or a final. It is not the sort of course that lends it to what can you write down or say in an hour and a half. It's, it, it's the sort of thing where you're going to pick up a great deal of information, but writing useful questions would be a little discouraging for everyone. So what do we do? Well, we start out saying, here, so to speak, it's a polymer molecule. It is a long, stringy molecule if it's in a good solvent. That's a polymer molecule in the solution. On the other hand, if you have a polymer molecule in a poor solvent, it will fold up in some sort of a ball. Now that one looks like a fairly well-organized ball, and that is because it is the most important set of polymers in poor solvents. It's a protein. Water is a poor solvent for proteins, most proteins. They form up and form very compact structures, very ordered structures, as opposed to, oh, this is polystyrene in benzene, a very dangerous solvent. You want to be careful of it. Um, and this is polystyrene and benzene. It sort of forms a large open coil. Uh, large, well, if we looked all of the way in on the structure of polystyrene, you'd have something. I'll give you the organic structure. And that is a benzene ring. And here we have an organic molecule. And the trick is, the polymer has all of these subunits, and it repeats a very large number of times. So the polymer chain is very thin. But if you measure along here, it's very long. Now, polymers don't have to be very long. This sometimes gets lost. And if you just have one or two or three monomers, we might say oligomer, 
meaning n small instead of polymer, but that is a distinction without much of a difference. Um, if you think about things, you will also realize that something has to happen at each of these ends, or you'd have dangling bonds, free radicals. That would be very bad. So what are we going to do in the course? We are going to discuss how polymers move in solution. Uh, and then we are going to discuss a few other related topics. So having said this, what are we going to do? Well, in a certain sense, we are a piece of the course retraces the history of polymer solutions. If you go back to, oh, 1910 or 1920, people knew about modestly large organic molecules, say tetrasaccharides. And there was some supposition that that was about as large as molecules could get. <coughs> um, people did know about proteins. Proteins were assumed to be association colloids, like gold colloids. The amino acids were stuck to each other. People knew there were amino acids in proteins. But the structure was completely random, and it was just things that stuck out of solution. We now know that approach is completely wrong. And it is in the 1920s that several people worked out, experimentally, that polymer molecules are actually very large molecules, much larger than the organic molecules that were known at the time. And their properties, their solution properties, arose because they were very large. Uh, solution properties, the conspicuous solution property at the front end <coughs> was viscosity. That is, if you have uh, water in a glass and pour it, tip the glass over, it pours. If you dissolve polymer in the water, you get a fast food chain milkshake, something that does not pour at all. And in some cases, it does not pour at all because it has had mixed in significant amounts of hydroxypropyl cellulose, an inert, very long chain polymer molecule that runs up the viscosity, the resistance to pouring. We'll be much more precise on this as the course goes on. So how, do we or how did I organize the course? Well, the organization of the textbook is not the historical organization of who studied what when. It's an effort to do things in a somewhat logical manner. Well, I tried. And so we actually will start out talking about driven motion of polymers. And driven motion, that is, we have this polymer solution. They're polymers. This is a little less magnification, but there's a polymer molecule. We apply some external force, F, on the polymer molecule, and it moves. And we can measure how fast it's moving. There are two sorts of ways to do this, and one is the centrifuge. And centrifugation has actually been used significantly to study polymer molecules. And the other, on which there is a huge literature not precisely pointed in our direction, is electrophoresis. So we'll start out talking about driven motion. We will then do an excursion. There are, co there are a couple of chapters in the book that are really side excursions that I could have stuck in any place, and sometimes it wasn't quite clear where to put it in. But the side excursion, what we'll talk about next, is quasi-elastic light scattering spectroscopy, for which I give you just the abbreviation. And that is a scattering method. Now, it's actually a somewhat complicated scattering method, we will talk about scattering in some detail because there are a lot of uses of scattering in materials. Um, X-ray scattering, 
light scattering for molecular weight determination. We'll talk somewhat less about the details of how quasi-elastic works. And then we start talking about, having done driven motion, we'll start talking about things that are actually thermal motions, well, mostly thermal motions. And we do this, well, first we will talk about single particle, and then we will talk about collective motions. Now, when I say single particle motion, that is perhaps a little imprecise, so let me fill in it in a bit more detail. We'll start out by saying, okay, we have a polymer solution. Here's a polymer, but it's not hovering in a vacuum. There are all these solvent molecules. And the solvent molecules are very important if you want to say there is a solution here. And so we will start out by talking about solvent malt motions, which turn out to be considerably more complicated than people thought 20 or 30 years ago. And then, having done solvent motions, we will push ahead to discuss what are called segmental motions. That is, segment, you have a big long polymer chain. The polymer chain is made of little pieces. And there are several techniques that let us reach in and look at a single piece and ask how that piece moves. Just a second, I'm going to close the door. And those are segmental motions. The third piece is really named by a technique. It's dielectric relaxation. Uh, the issue in dielectric relaxation is that if you apply an electrical field to a molecule, it can move. Its shape can change, its orientation can change. <clears throat> At high frequencies there are other issues that come in. <coughs> and so if we have this <coughs> pardon me, molecule here, there is a vector from one end to the other, end to end vector, and we can measure how long it is, and we can measure how its direction changes due to the diffusion of the polymer molecule. I'm just really giving a sketch. If you find some of this unfamiliar, we'll be doing it in much more detail in a bit. Finally, single particle motions, we will be talking about self and tracer diffusion. Self and tracer diffusion? Yes. We have our polymer chain here. It's in a fluid. It's more or less free to move. Well, that's not exactly true because the solvents get in the way. Other polymer coils get in the way. And therefore, the rate at which a polymer molecule can move in through solution is affected by its environment. And the simplest experiment you can ask is, well, we will identify one chain. And we will, so to speak, label it by painting it green. Um, you actually have to be a little more clever than that. And because we have labeled this one chain, we can watch the one chain move relative to the entire background. The reason there are two names here is that the chain we're watching could be identical with its neighbors, except that we've labeled it, or it could be different from its neighbors. So we have a chain of one species, and we have surrounding polymer chains of a different species. If everything is the same, we're talking about self-diffusion. If they're different, we're talking about tracer diffusion. Finally, single particle motion, we will talk about probe diffusion. <coughs> 
And that is actually one of the larger chapters of the book. So what are we going to say about probe diffusion? Well, what is it, first of all? So here's our polymer solution. And we are going to drop into the polymer solution something that is not like a polymer at all. And the representative object, there are several variations. You've got choices here, is a colloidal sphere. And the sphere does Brownian motion, just diffuses through solution. It diffuses through solution just in the same way that a polymer does. However, that's obviously not a polymer coil. It's rigid, it's spherical, typical case. And when we measure the diffusion, it moves of the sphere through the polymer solution, we get experimental information out of it. Okay, we now get another excursion. Uh, and I think we will start the excursion over here. And the excursion is colloid dynamics. You may assume that we're going to come back and cover all of this in a lot more detail, but I'm giving you a course outline. Okay, what is a colloid? A colloid is a microscopic or nanoscopic particle. It's produced by any of a wide variety of synthetic methods. The simplest colloidal particles are spheres, and colloids in liquids are stable. That is, Considering that we are having a blizzard, or near blizzard, or more earlier, what can we say? Uh, in any event, a colloid is a sphere. A typical diameter might be, oh, or radius might be, oh, 200 angstroms. And because for a typical thing that we're going to talk about, we are in water or some neutral solvent. If we're in water, these things are charged one way or the other. And the net result is that colloidal suspension is stable. The Brownian motion is such that the particles don't settle out of solution. You can also get colloid suspensions that aren't stable at all. If you take beach sand and stir it up in water, it will float some distance above the, the sur surface of the bottom of the pond, but if you wait a bit, the sand will settle out. Colloidal particles are very small, they don't settle. And they have dynamics. In fact, colloidal particles have more or less all of the same dynamic properties that polymer chains do. They can do all of the same motions in all of the same ways, more or less. Uh, the one exception is right here, segmental motion. Colloidal particles are rigid. They don't have internal motions. And this means, in certain senses, they're very simple. The other features of colloidal dynamics, though, <clears throat> which is important, is that the forces between colloid particles in solution and the forces between polymer chains in solution are basically the same. They're in a solvent, and that has a whole bunch of consequences called hydrodynamic interactions. We'll get to that later. And they can't move through each other. And as a result, there are a whole bunch, of all, not only are all of the experiments that you can do on one or the other the same, but there ought to be some similarity if the forces are the same. The significance of this we'll get to later in the course. Um, okay, that's colloidal dynamics. And now, we will go back to polymers. I started by saying we'll study driven motion. Then we will study single particle motions or small pieces of particle motion. And now we get to 
collective motions. And by collective motions, I am referring to the notion that we have polymers in solution, and they have properties that arise because there are multiple polymers and they interact with each other, and the property is determined by the fact there is more than one polymer there. Simplest example, I'm going to plot concentration of polymer versus position. And we have a process known as diffusion. And so concentration, position, we get something like this. Yes. And what happens if you have something dissolved in water and the concentration is not the same everywhere? Well, if you sit and wait a long time, the stuff will transport from the low concentration regions away and the high concentration regions, and it will transport so after a while, in most cases, the concentration becomes uniform. The classic freshman chemistry example of this, which is fake, is that I stand in the front of the room and I open a vial of perfume and spray a bit around and we sit and wait and after a while the folks in the back of the class have no problem smelling the perfume if I use enough of it. Now this process, what I, what I just described you is actually not diffusion. Diffusion is a very slow process. In order to get gas moving across a room, the sort of yard scale motion well, the reason for that is there's air circulation, there's convection, people are moving and have set the air into motion, and so you're actually seeing a different transport process than you were told in freshman chemistry. However, on a microscopic scale, a very small scale, diffusion is very important. And what happens? High concentration, low concentration, is that in regions where there's a concentration gradient, dc dx, you get a current, j, the stuff flows. Well, it doesn't really flow. The molecules move, and due to their thermal motions, they rearrange, and when they have finished rearranging, you have um, in the end, the concentration becomes uniform. <clears throat> so we will talk, now you say, didn't we talk about diffusion before? Didn't we talk about one chain moving through others? Yes, I brought that up earlier. However, there are two different sorts of diffusive processes. There is what we call self-diffusion, which is just one chain moving through a uniform background. And then there is the diffusive process we are talking about here, which is mutual diffusion, which is lots of chains moving because there is a concentration gradient, dc dx. In general, these two diffusion processes are not the same. Now I say in general because if you're in di very dilute solution, they become practically indistinguishable. However, so that's diffusion, but there's some other collective properties. The first collective property that we talk about is viscosity. Symbol is the Greek letter eta. And the viscosity is the resistance to pouring. The larger the viscosity it is, the harder it is to get something to pour. The smaller the viscosity, the more easily something pours. Then, beyond viscosity, we have what we call 
linear viscoelasticity. The issue in linear viscoelasticity is, well, we say there's a resistance to pouring. So I have, for example, a tube. I apply a uniform pressure to one end, and there's a flow rate down the tube. However, I could also, instead of saying, instead of applying a uniform force, I could apply a time-dependent force. Uh, for example, I have some the pipe, and um, the liquid is quiescent, it's just sitting there. I now turn on the pressure, apply pressure, and there's a transient while the fluid starts moving and comes up to speed. Uh, for, for simple liquids, um, you turn the force on, and the fluid starts moving more or less immediately, except it may be compressible. For a polymer solution, life is more complicated. Polymer solutions behave as they, though they have little springs in them. It will be more precise as time goes on. And so, for example, I will draw a sketch. We are looking in from the side. There are two flat plates. And if this were simply water, and I oscillate one plate back and forth, so it's moving back and forth, there's a force on the lower plate. And if I simply take this plate and displace it a distance very quickly and stop, there is very briefly a force on the lower plate. With a polymer solution, if I take the upper plate and I displace this sideways, there's a force on the lower plate, and the force on the lower plate has an extended, lasts over an extended period of time, and it has a complicated time dependence. When we get to this, it'll become more clear. That's linear viscoelasticity. Why do we call it linear? Well, that's true, but there's another reason, too. You're right, but there's another reason. And the other reason is, suppose I displace the plate sideways. Suppose I displace the plate sideways again. Each of these displacements on the, of the upper plate creates, it's a friction effect, a force on the lower plate. And each of these two forces depends on time. And we ask, what is the force on the lower plate, given that I've displaced the upper plate twice at two different times? And the answer is, it's linear. The force on the lower plate is just the sum of the force due to this displacement, if it had happened by itself, and the force due to that displacement, if it had happened by itself. OK? Let's let you may say, why do you bother to call it linear? And the answer is, there is also nonlinear viscoelasticity. And there are two sorts of nonlinear viscoelasticity. There are classical experiments. And then there are more modern, there's a set of modern experiments which are really fundamentally different from the classical ones. What do I mean by a classical experiment that shows nonlinear viscoelasticity? Well, I will show you one. Here's a tub that contains a polymer solution or a liquid, some liquid. And I put into it a stirrer bar. And I rotate the stirrer bar. <coughs> well, if I do this in freshman chemistry lab, the stirrer is spinning, the liquid is spinning, 
and the liquid is pushed up against the sides of the vessel. <coughs> if you've ever used a mix master at home, you've seen this effect in action. Now we will replace the orthodox liquid with a viscoelastic polymer solution. And we start see we stir again, rotate the rod, and we get rod climbing. What is rod climbing? The solution climbs up the rod. The reason the solution climbs up the rod is that there is a pressure in the liquid, just as there is a pressure in water. But because we are in a, non, a system that has a nonlinear viscoelastic effect, the pressure, instead of just being a number, becomes a, a three by three matrix, and the pressure in different directions is not the same. And if you it, because if the liquid is being sheared. Well, polymers can do this, normal liquids don't very much. So that is nonlinear viscoelasticity. Um, and I have now gone through a sort of run over rather quickly all of the topics that we're going to talk about. Okay, so how are we actually going to talk about them? Well, this is a course, it says so in the book title, on phenomenology. Phenomenology is a study of what happens experimentally. And so we look at experiment and we let the experiments lead us to an understanding of how liquids work. Now, this isn't just a blind use of experiment. Um, there are several competing models, theoretical models, for how polymer solutions behave. And as you will discover as I lead you through the course, some of the models are good, and some of the models make predictions that are consistently wrong. And we will charge through, but we will be mostly focused, not completely, on what the experiments are saying. Um, the way we'll do that as a practical matter for a fair part, the book has all of these wonderful figures in them, and I will point you at the figures and I will draw sketches on the board, but my expectation is you will actually, for once, bring the textbook to class because we will actually be using it so I can point at the figures and you will have them in front of you. And if you want to take notes, you don't have to try to sketch a graph with 200 data points on it. You've got the graph and you can make notes on it and you can see very clearly exactly what the data looks like. So for once you will actually be bringing your book to class and you will be getting some use out of doing so. As I recall being an undergraduate, we never actually did that, but it's, this is a different sort of course. Okay, so I have gone over all of these methods, and they all are used to study polymer solutions. A rational question is, well, where does this whole discussion fit in with the broader study of polymers and under different conditions? And where does it fit in with the other books that I can pull out of the library, which you are going to be doing, because I said, the course is going to be based on writing research reports. Now I realize a few of you may not have English as your native language, and I am willing to be quite forgiving on that, though I will correct, because you know, one of the th reasons you come to a foreign country is to learn how to speak the local language. Um, uh, the other reason for doing the research reports is this is a grad research class and you are going to be exposed to the primary literature. Okay. There are lots and lots of books on polymer solution and dynamics. And if you read them and you read enough of them, um, you eventually notice what is not discussed. So let us start out with, here's a sort of graph of concentration. And we start out at approximately zero 
and here is the test tube, and there is exactly one polymer chain in it. That is as diluted polymer solution as you can get. At the other extreme, we have something that is all polymer and nothing else. Now, the reason I bring up all polymer and nothing else, a polymer molecules, many of them, not all of them, but many of them, if you heat them up and isolate them from air in some cases, give you a melt. You have polymer and it's melted just the way as if you take iron and heat it up in a blast furnace, you get liquid iron. Well, if you take polymers and heat them up, you get liquid polymer. Um, and if you look at a lot of books, there is a considerable study of dilute solution, and there is a considerable discussion of melt properties. And if there were a 16th century European map, it would carefully be labeled, here be dragons, or something equally improbable. And there's sort of a gap. And if you are not reading carefully, you don't realize there's a gap. It's just that there is a discussion of dilute solution properties. There is a discussion of melt. And everything in between is compressed to a couple or four pages. There's a rational reason for this. If you are doing industrial processing, in large numbers of classical cases, you're doing something like injection molding. You take the liquid polymer, you push it under pressure into an object of some shape, which receives it. You worry about little details like getting the object plastic out when it's cooled off. And thus, melt properties have important industrial applications. Or if you want to prepare thin plastic sheets, the things you use for kitchen wrap, well, you're doing film casting. You start out with the liquid, you start out with the polymer, and somehow you spread it out into being a film. Therefore, melt properties are very important. At the other end, over here, why would we care about dilute solution properties? And the answer is, you have a polymer. It has a length. It's a number of repeat units. But another way of saying the polymer has a length is that the polymer has a molecular weight. And you know about molecular weight. So we have water, and its molecular weight is 18 daltons. And you have a polymer, it has a bunch of repeat units, and it has a molecular weight. Except the molecular weight of a polymer might be, oh, 300,000 or a million. It has become interesting for scientific reasons to prepare polymers of what historically would be viewed as huge molecular weights. And people can produce polymers of molecular weights of, oh, 30 million or whatever. Then, of course, there is this huge field of research known as biotechnology where people want to study DNAs. DNA is a polymer. It has a very complicated structure, which I would not care to try to draw on the board during one class, except by cheating. Um, and the important issue is the molecular weights you can get up there can be huge, like 10 to the 9. Some DNAs are much smaller in molecular weight, but you can get absolutely huge mo uh, molecular weights. And an important issue is, remember we're using melts to do industrial work? Well, the properties of the melt are substantially determined by the molecular weight of the polymer and, and the distribution of molecular weights, because the polymers aren't all the same size. And the easy techniques for measuring polymer molecular weights work in dilute solution. And so if you are sitting trying to do industrial processing, you're also very interested in dilute solution properties 
because that's how the batch shows up on a truck. You'd like to know what the molecular weight really is, and dilute solution measurements get you that. Well, that's fine, except there's this big region in between. And the interest in this course is mostly in the big region in between. The region which is non-dilute. What do I mean non-dilute? Well, here's dilute. There's only one polymer chain. Now I put more polymer chains in. And as I put more and more polymer chains in, the viscosity of the solution starts to go up. And eventually, the polymer solutions, start, the polymer chains, start to get in each other's way. They interact with each other. They keep each other from moving or something. Well, the or something is the point on this course. And therefore, we get to non-dilute solutions. Now, I've sort of drawn this with lines. That's a bit of fudge, because really you have something that's continuous here. You have one polymer molecule in solution, two Avogadro's number, but there's a continuum of solutions. On the other side, in some cases, you have a continuum through to the melt. That is, you have a solvent, you have a polymer, and as you make the polymer concentration higher and higher and higher, eventually you get to the polymer, and the polymer is a liquid. That doesn't have to be that way. The other thing that could happen is you run the concentration up and up and up, and you hit a solubility limit. And above the solubility limit, you have a solution, a saturated solution, and a second phase, you have a solid polymer. Because at that temperature, you can only put a certain amount of polymer into the solution. That's like, say, dissolving sugar in water. You can dissolve a certain amount of sugar in water, but at some point, it just won't go in anymore. Um, the complication of charge of being able to do this, if you say it's a polymer melt, it may have to be fairly warm. And if it's fairly warm or hot, the vapor pressure of the solvent may be very high, and you may get boiling instead of the effect you want. Now, another way to do this, though, here's the melt, or the solid. Here's the solid. And what I can do is to start putting in individual solvent molecules of some sort. And they're just traces of solvent molecules spread out in that polymer. The polymer is almost certainly an amorphous solid, not a crystal. And now we've put mole extra molecules in. Why would you do that? The little things are called plasticizers. Plasticizers, so to speak, typically, lubricate the motion of the polymer. And as a result, you can, by dissolving small molecules in an amorphous polymer, you can change its properties. It's an additive, right? It's an additive, correct. If you ever, car tires are a good example of this. PVC. It's hmm? the PVC editors, the polymer that. Uh, yes. You have a polymer. A car, classic car tires, the additive was carbon yeah. particles. Uh, another example, if you have seen Teflon tape that you use to seal joints, uh, real pure Teflon, actual Teflon, is very brittle. If you tried bending it, it would just shatter. So you add plasticizers to the Teflon, and now the Teflon gives you this nice smooth tape, uh, which is the despair of plumbers because it means that amateurs like me can fix joints around the house in an emergency.
Uh, however, Teflon tape actually works. And it works because of the plasticizer. But this is a solution. It may be a solid solution. And as you add more and more plasticizer, you move this way. And in some cases, you can move continuously into a non-dilute or dilute solution. <clears throat> OK, let us clear this off. Uh, the first chapter or two of the book, and the introduction, list a bunch of additional references on polymer solutions and their properties. Uh, they are, if you look at them, you will find the topics they cover are a subset, a somewhat restricted subset of the properties I talk about. And in many cases, the focus is very much more, for very sound historical reasons, on melt properties rather than solution properties. Nonetheless, there are a lot of other references out there, and it is worthwhile for you to look at them. I will ask, though, that if you get from, to books in the library, that you read them in the library so your fellow students can find them. I didn't put the whole library on reserve. I suppose I could have. OK. <clears throat> so I have described this. And we now come to the G. What is known about this, and why did I bother to write the book? And this comes to theoretical models that I will occasionally invoke, but except in the very last lecture, I will not be discussing in any great detail. Um, so we'll start out with dilute solution. And if we have dilute solution, we have polymer chains, and they move, and they have properties such as diffusion. And if you say I have a chunk of a polymer chain here moving, it sets up a wake in the sort of wake, like the wake of a motorboat. It drags the water around or solvent along it along. And if this is if the little piece of polymer is moving, the neighboring solvent is dragged along. Well, if the neighboring solvent is dragged along, this piece of polymer here is also dragged along. And so if you have polymer chains moving through a liquid, each piece of polymer chain has what is known as a hydrodynamic. a solvent-mediated force that it creates on its neighbors. The solvent-mediated force is described by something known as the Ocene tensor. Um, tensor is a threatening word, but what it really means is, here's a point in the liquid. I apply a force on the liquid. The force is a vector. Over here, if I'm patient, the liquid, not very patient at all, but slightly patient, the liquid responds by moving with a velocity v, and v and f are not parallel. Well, how do I, just, how do I mathematically set up something that says I have a vector as the input, I have a vector as the output, and the two vectors aren't parallel to each other? If they were parallel, it would be easy. In the freshman physics case is F equals MA. The force vector and the acceleration vector are proportional to each other, and they're parallel. So M can just be a scalar, a number. Here, however, the two vectors are not parallel. And the question is, what do we do to generate one, ve one vector out of another? And the answer is and T is a three by three matrix. Mm -hmm. 
And if you think way, way back, some of you, it's way, way back in time, you saw a vector multiplying a matrix and it get, gives you another vector out. And G, that is the Ocene tensor. And the reason it's a tensor and we have to use it is that the output vector, the, form, the velocity of the liquid, is not everywhere in the solution parallel to the force. Now, if you might say, gee, aren't there symmetry constraints? Oh, there are a whole bunch of constraints. I said force, flow, but over here on the other side, the vector is obliged to be a mirror image. We are not going to do this sort of math issue in a lot of detail. I'm going to talk about phenomenology, not about um, theory for the most part. So if you want to talk about dilute, dilute solutions, you can do calculations on single polymer chains. And if you do a calculation on a single chain, well, there are a number of theories. There's one due to Kirkwood. and Reisman. There's another one due to Rouse, and the third due to Zim. The Rouse and Zim models are actually quite similar, and they actually do calculations like this. And the, the objective of the calculation is, well, we have a polymer chain, we put it into a liquid, for example, how fast can the polymer chain diffuse? What effect does the polymer chain have on the viscosity of the liquid? If I take the polymer chains and I make them longer, use two different polymers for that actually. If I compare two polymers of two different lengths, at the same weight concentration, how do they affect the viscosity of the solution? And the answer is, that's why these theories are done, the viscosity is proportional to m molecular weight to some power, but it's not first power, it's some lower power. And we can do actually do theories like this. So that's dilute solution. However, if you try to take these dilute solution theories <coughs> and compare them with melt properties, you find um, the melts show a bunch of things that the dilute solution models do not. For example, they show viscoelasticity. more detailed sketch of viscoelasticity at a later time. They also show shear thinning. Shear thinning is much easier to draw. We have two parallel plates with a liquid in between. I move the upper plate at some velocity v. I clamp the lower plate in position so it doesn't move. And I ask how much force I need to apply to move the upper plate. Alternatively, this is harder to analyze theoretically, I take a pipe and I push liquid down the pipe and I ask how the flow rate determined, is determined by the applied pressure. Well, if I have a Newtonian fluid, water, Newtonian fluid, it has a simple viscosity eta, and um, the force that is developed is proportional to the viscosity, and it's determined by the velocity and by this distance The force is determined by the velocity gradient. Oh, I'd better be a little careful with my index labels here. 
This is the direction z. That is the direction x. I have liquid moving in the x direction, but the velocity depends on the height z between the plates. So down here at z equals 0, the liquid is touching the stationary plate, not moving. And as I move up this way, the liquid is moving faster and faster, and is eventually at speed v. And the force is determined by this constant, and the, the gradient dvx dz. So if I push the plates closer together and keep v constant, v is constant, this distance delta z is smaller, so the gradient is bigger, and the force is bigger. And in a certain sense, you've all seen this, if you try to push a liquid through a small pipe at some rate, you have to push harder than if you're going through a big pipe. <clears throat> okay, well that's a Newtonian fluid. If you have shear thinning, traditional symbol is kappa, Greek K, is dvx dz. And eta, the viscosity, is a function of the shear rate. So if you start things flowing more rapidly, the viscosity go well, I better draw a plot, haven't I? Eta, kappa, and what happens is, this is actually a log plot, because the shear rate can be changed by a lot, but at some point, the shear rate rolls over, and if you shear the liquid faster, you see shear thinning the liquid flows more easily than it would at zero shear. There is also shear thickening. Um, once upon a time, that was controversial. There were people who denied that there was such a thing as shear thickening. But in fact, there is, a shear, is shear thickening, and you have liquids that are happy to flow if you don't push on them too hard. But if you push on them hard, they don't quite turn to a solid, but they thicken up a lot. Very concentrated starch solutions, some of them, have this very strange property. So in any event, we talk, talked about this, because if we go to the melt, we have a property described as viscoelasticity, the flow of the liquid is not what you would have expected from dilute solution descriptions. This has been known for a long time. It's, it shows up industrially whether you care about the theory or not. Namely, you try, um, for example, doing injection molding, and all sorts of odd things can happen. Um, and then the nonlinear effects, which are even stranger, come in, and you are trying to get this industrial machine to work, and all these weird things are occurring. Um, the challenge for a very long time was that you had dilute solution theories that were known from the 30s and 40s, but they certainly did not describe any of the things that occurred in concentrated solutions. And so, there were a number of very different theoretical efforts to explain what was going on. Uh, this is not a theory course, so I am not going to do the theoretical calculations. I mean, I could. I think most of you would find this not to be why you were wanted to be here. Um, some of you would find it why you wanted to be someplace else very quickly. Um, however, I should give a little sketch of the theory because I will occasionally invoke the theoretical model concepts. And so I'm going to give a few of them. And the first is what is known as the entanglement idea. And the entanglement idea is to in particular to a review by Bill Bracely. And I'm not going to give you a detailed history, 
the notion is, here is a polymer chain. Here is another polymer chain looping around it. And where polymer chains get close to each other, they can get wrapped around each other. Now, this is not a covalent bond. However, if you don't work, wait very long, if the notion is if you try to pull this chain this way and that chain that way, the chains aren't physically bonded, but it's like untangling two pieces of um, string that are round, wrapped around each other. They tend to stick even though they're not fastened. And entanglements as an idea tended to explain the viscoelastic effects. That is, if you have two chains, if they're very short, they really can't knot up each other. But if they're long enough, those the chains are wrapped around each other somehow, last a long time, and behave as though you have, if not a cross-linked gel, something that on short time scales behaves as a gel. And so the notion is that polymer chains can somehow knot each other up, and this contributes to the behavior in the melt. In dilute solution, it does not contribute, because here's a chain, it's dilute, the other chain is over there, and since they're away or far away from each other, you don't get effects like this very much. <coughs> now the next idea, which refers to diffusion mostly, are a series of models known as Oxton, by the Oxton models. Oxton was the fellow who worked it out. And the notion is you have polymer chains, and they look like a lattice. In the simplest model, they're a lattice of toothpicks. And they're all toothpicks, short pieces of wood, are all jumbled together. And if you are something trying to diffuse, move through this lattice, you have to find a hole that is big enough for you to get through. You have a diameter D. The hole has a size H. And if you want to get through, D has to be less than H. Now, that is not exactly correct. But this is the starting point of these models. And the models set, explain why, for example, um, if you try to measure diffusion in a polymer solution, it's suppressed. And now we push ahead. And there were a series of models due in particular to Jean, who was a French theoretical physicist, and other people of his school. And the models are called reputation scaling. And I am not going to give you, I'm just giving you a very slight sketch of what is going on so you're aware there are theoretical models which we're going to talk about in more detail in later lectures. And the idea of reputation is. Let us start out by talking about a real gel in which we have lots of polymer molecules and they're all covalently bonded to each other. They've been welded together chemically where they cross. You make real covalent gels. Polyacrylamide with crosslinkers does this. And we will now put in a single polymer chain, a long chain, and we ask how the polymer chain can move through the gel diffusion. And the answer is it's obliged to move parallel to its own length. It, if we have a piece of it here, it can't move sideways very far because it runs into the gel. That's why um, there is a child's toy known as a jungle gym. It's a bunch of steel pipes that are cross-linked in three dimensions, and you can, um, sort of, so to speak, climb through it if you're a small child. The pipes don't move, 
And so you have to move through it one step at a time. Okay? Well, this is a random jungle gym. This is a very long snake-like object, hence reputation. And the, the polymer chain can only diffuse parallel to its own length. It can move backwards, it can move forwards, it cannot move sideways. Uh, that turns out to be a, a rather powerful restriction. And put on top of that, we then impose the notion of scaling, which actually comes out of critical phenomena theory. And it's proposed, for example, that the diffusion coefficient well, it'll depend on the molecular weight of the polymer. The larger the polymer is, the slower it moves. It will depend on the concentration of those, that gel. The more gel is in the way, the slower the polymer moves. And then there will be powers like m to the x, c to the y. Those powers are what are called scaling exponents. And the notion is you do whole bunches of experiments and the relation between, say, diffusion coefficient and molecular weight or concentration of the gel or whatever is, if you put it on a log-log plot, it's a straight line. This is, these are power laws. So that's scaling. Well, I talked about it for gels and the Radical extrapolation is to say that a polymer solution basically behaves like a gel. This is the Dijen proposal. <coughs> and therefore, whatever we see for, we can use the same theoretical arguments with some minor qualifications and corrections and improvements, and we can predict how polymers will move in solution. And the main statement is that if we are in constant, concentrated polymer solutions, in the Dijen picture, the polymer chains can only move back and forth along their own chain contour. Okay? And when we do calculations and predictions, we say there should be scaling laws being predicted. And what the theory does is to predict these exponents. Of course, it also does something else. It says that if I plot log d against the log of concentration of polymers, I should see power law on a log log plot. What do power laws look like? Someone must know this. They're straight lines. If you take a power law and you put it on a log-log plot, it becomes a straight line. Well, it looks like a straight line, anyhow. It's linear. Observe. D proportional to C V X. Log D is proportional to X log C. And therefore, if I do a plot of log D against log C, I get a straight line whose slope x is this exponent. Well, that's the model's claim. It is the claim. I promise you that. And there is a very extensive set of calculations on this. <coughs> um, however, there is a little difficulty. And the little difficulty is called experiment. And if you actually do bunches of different experiments and cover large ranges of concentration and molecular weight and this, that, and the other thing, and you look, plot, do log-log plots, there is a difficulty. You essentially never find any straight lines. You see smooth curves. Okay. Um, however, the smooth curves have a form. Oh, I'll put up scaling first. We will look at, say, the diffusion of a polymer chain through a solution. And that's simply a 
representative transport coefficient. I could talk about viscosity or bunches of these other things. But here is an example. It's the diffusion coefficient of the single chain. And as you increase the concentration of other chains, the diffusion coefficient slows down. And it's supposed to slow down as a power law. This is not what happens. And we will spend much of the course where I will show you that instead the diffusion coefficient goes as some zero e to the minus alpha, that's a constant, c to the nu, that's another constant. This is a functional form known as a stretched exponential. That is, the, uh, it's an exponential, but the argument C of the exponential has been raised to some power nu. Um, that was first found more or less empirically, mostly by me, uh, since I was the one doing that particular chunk of work. And the, uh, the, if you come up with a form, an empirical form, what you find is people are saying, well, that's very nice, but um, there's no theoretical basis for it, which is a polite way of saying, you better find a theory that predicts this, because otherwise people won't believe you. And that would be the last lecture of the course, the hydrodynamic scaling model. Okay, we have gone through, and I've said something about polymer transport properties, and the ones we're going to talk about, and I have said a fair amount about, at least a bit about what each of them is. I talked very briefly about theoretical models that make predictions. There's actually going to be a lot of theory interwoven with the course, it's going to be presented mostly in terms of results as opposed to here is a calculation and you can use it to do more calculations yourself. Um, so we're going, the course in that sense is going to be descriptive a little bit more than it's going to be formal theoretical. Uh, the one large exception to that is when I talk about scattering but scattering is something that is extremely useful even if you're doing oh, solid aluminum and you study the crystal structure with x-ray or neutron scattering, it's the same scattering theory. Well, so where does that leave us in terms of what we're going to do? What I would like you to do for the next time, let's see, we next meet next Wednesday, is I would like you to go in and I would like you to read reasonably carefully uh, the first chapter and the introduction, there are a couple of forewords and introductions, and they actually contain important things. And I would like you to read the first chapter, which gets you through page nine. And I would then like you at least to have looked at chapter two. So, read carefully chapter one and at least skim chapter two. Now, there will be bunches of things that are sort of referred to uh, that I don't describe in detail in the book because to some extent the book was written for people who have some background in polymers. And it may be you are going to hit a fair amount where you ought to do your own reading so that, for example, when you skim chapter two, you will find a reference to good polymer solvents and poor solvents and theta solvents. And you would be sensibly advised when you hit something like that, um, do some sort of internet search or whatever. The internet makes this incredibly easier than it was when I was a graduate student. Um, and see that you've at least, and see what the topic is and get some information on what is being discussed. So I say this is an, this is an advanced graduate course. Uh, what you get out of the course 
will very much depend on what you put into it. If you just do exactly what I say in terms of reading, um, it will be true, but there will be a lot more that can be obtained if you do some more searching. Uh, also, which is much, much infinitely easier than it was 15 years ago, for example, you hit chapter 2, and I say all of this can be traced back to the paper by Langevin and Rondelez on theory of sedimentation of probes. Well, that's a footnote. You don't even have to walk over to a library anymore to pull it off the shelf, find the volume, hopefully it's on the shelf. You can simply pull it down off the internet. You have the paper and you can see what they talked about. And when you are doing the reading assignments, I will tell you, for example, the first one, will, actually I'll tell you what the first reading assignment was. It will be on electrophoresis and it will be to take a year of the journal electrophoresis pull out the papers that are similar to the ones we talk about, that is only a small fraction of them, and see what they say or, or could be used to study that is not the same as what you've studied already or seen in the book. And I'll go into much more detail on what that means, but it'll be a literature search, and it'll be the sort of literature search where you know about where to look, but there will be a whole lot of wonderful papers, superb papers, that have nothing to do with the topic you're interested in. And I will give you some hints for finding the ones that you should care about. Okay, so I have two minutes left. And the question is, why did I bother to write the book? And the actual answer is, there had been this very long period going back from oh, 85 to about 2000 where I had had a dispute with some of my colleagues as to what the experiments actually said about polymer dynamics. And they would say, well you should look at this or you should look at that. So I looked more or less at everything. This is a, I won't claim I found every paper but I looked at more or less every sort of experimental measurement. And then I added the colloid discussion, and, and you will discover what the um, colloid discussion you cannot find in any of the other polymer references. I added the whole discussion on electrophoresis as a probe of polymer dynamics, and you will not find that anywhere else because it's essentially, yeah, there's wonderful studies of electrophoresis for a long time, my contribution is saying you can use it to understand polymer dynamics as opposed to biochemistry. Um, so that is roughly where we are.